Um, good evening and welcome to tonight's King's Talk. It is entitled, Do You Want to Be an Entrepreneur? My name is Greg Hunter and I am the Deputy Head Co-Curricular here at King's. Tonight, we are absolutely delighted to welcome back OKS and Old Grange boy, Dinesh Demija. There is almost too much to say about Dinesh, but I'll give you two things about him. One, he, he was the founder of ebookers.com, which I'm sure like if you're like me, you would have used at some stage for Book of Holiday. But the second one is that he's currently on the advisory board for Innovate UK, which gives 1.4 billion pounds of loans a year to businesses. Leading the question and answer will be our wonderful OKS president, David Peters. After the interview, uh, after, after the presentation, uh, we will be taking questions from you, the audience. So please, at any stage, type your question into the Q&A function as part of Zoom. Or alternatively, when it comes to the question time, please don't hesitate to put your hand up and we'll see if we can find a chance to put you on, on the air to ask your question directly of Dinesh yourself. Now, it is with great pleasure that I pass over to both Dinesh and David. David, over to you. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Greg. Um, I just have a very few words to add to uh, Greg's uh, comments before we uh, bring Dinesh into play. Um, I'm delighted to be helping to host this this evening because Dinesh and I overlapped together both at King's and later on at university. Uh, Dinesh is a true international citizen. He has lived and traveled in many different countries around the world. And um, armed with a law degree and a professional grounding in IBM, he then later on set out to create his own pioneering online travel business, which, as Greg said, became eBookers. And this was the first interactive online travel agency in the UK. So Dinesh is an entrepreneur in the truest sense, and today he shares his expertise with budding entrepreneurs as a director of Innovate. He will talk for about 20 minutes or so, and then we will take your questions and answer as many of them as we can at the end. So please pose your questions as we go and I'll put them to Dinesh when we get to the close of his speech. So over to you, Dinesh. Thank you, David. Thank you very much, Greg, both of you. Uh, it's been a pleasure dealing with you before this talk. Um, do you want to be an entrepreneur? And that's the question. And the point is, I'm going to be obviously wanting everyone to be an entrepreneur. Having said that, there is a, a warning on the cigarette packet or on the bottle. And that is that only one in five entrepreneurs succeed. So just 20%. If you go into a casino and play the roulette wheel or the roulette table, you're gonna have at least a 48% chance of winning. This is 20%. And I can tell you casinos make a lot of money. The other thing of course is that you have a lot of uh, hassle when you're starting up, you know, if you're, you're, you have children or your, your partner uh, doesn't get enough of your time and so on and so forth, and many divorces and many lives ruined. So be very careful before you go on this journey, because when you want to be an entrepreneur, it's 24-7, 365. There are no holidays. There is nothing, but if you can last for four or five years, bootstrap or whatever you like, it, your business should create a lot of wealth or the start of a lot of wealth, improve your standard of living in a meaningful way, provide jobs to people, and God knows we need jobs at the moment, COVID, and obviously pay higher taxes and, and build a social infrastructure around you. So uh, I mentioned jobs. I think it's so important. That we, if the furlough scheme is stopped tomorrow, which it is not going to be, but if it is stopped tomorrow, I reckon that we will have 15 to 20% unemployment in the, in the country. This is not good, it could lead to civil disobedience, etc. And I think that we need as many entrepreneurs as we can get to try and suck up the unemployment that is going to take place that COVID has brought out. I say COVID has brought out because COVID uh, has made people work from home and people have realized 
you actually don't need as many people as, as they've had to work and thus redundancies are going to follow. Obviously office spaces are going to be let go as well. So uh, um, I, I see a big problem and I hope it doesn't happen. But you know, the other thing of course is that we have to build brand UK because we Brexited. And, and uh, brand UK means a lot of people coming in here, uh, taking up jobs, building businesses and making this a vibrant economy. And we have to do that. So let me go through, by the way, I, I started selling air tickets at one pound profit in Earl's Court tube station on the Warwick Road side. If you know about Earl's Court, there are two entrances. The Warwick Road is the, the rubbish entrance. And that's where I was, 80 square feet. You couldn't swing a cat. And there was me and my wife, and we started off uh, selling tickets. 24 years later, I sold the business for $471 million. So I'm gonna, how did I get from A to B from, 2000, uh, from 1980 to 2004? And, that, and I didn't have a plan. The only thing that I knew was that the, the old Labour government was in power and the lowest rate of tax was 40%, 10% national insurance. So if you earned a salary, 50% of your money went to the government. Now, I didn't mind that because everyone else was doing it. And I thought, if I got self-employed, could I expense that money that I was paying in taxes and double my standard of living? And that was the first thing that came to my mind to try and double my standard of living uh, to start a business. And of course we bootstrapped, we, 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 we didn't know we were going to sell the business 25 years later for a lot of money, but we did know that we had to survive for five years because that is when a business becomes stable. And on the way, there were lots of lessons and I'll give you four or five lessons that I've learned. When we went for that kiosk, it was owned by someone who, who said he wanted 3,000 pounds for key money and we didn't have 3,000 pounds. So we said, uh, his name was Jim. We said, Jim, can we give you 1,500 pounds after one month and 1,500 pounds after four months? And I thought that if we couldn't make 1,500 pounds in one month, it wasn't worth doing the business. So we actually got in free we made 1,500 pounds, gave it to him. And then of course we made the other 15 in four months, uh, four months and we had, a, we had a, a, an office and that's how we got into business. So that was cash flow is king. Use other people's cash and not your own. At another time, a year later, Bob Dylan was playing at the Earl's Court Arena. And there was this bearded guy who came into this kiosk and said, I need a box office. And uh, they're not allowing me a box office in, Earl's, in the Earl's Court Arena. Can you be the box office? And I didn't know that time, but it was Harvey Goldsmith. And, uh, and, uh, and I said, but we're travel agents. He said, well, I'll give you 2000 pounds for four days. And I said, what do I have to do? And for four days, I closed the telephone lines and became a box office for Harvey Goldsmith. As it happened, there were people returning tickets and there were other things that we had to do for Harvey Goldsmith. And we made about 7,000 pounds. Now in 1981, 7,000 pounds was a lot of money, but there you are. It was just amazing. So no preconceived ideas when you go into business. And then I'll, I'll skip a few years and I'll go into, we were in a, on a bus in Tokyo 
and the traffic is, was terrible. I'm talking about 1994. And my wife and I, who ran the business, were discussing budgets for next year. And uh, my wife said 20% extra in sales would be good. And I said, no, no, let's do 40%. And across the aisle, there was an American couple and this American chap said, have you tried 100%? And we, we didn't even know anyone was listening to us. So we looked at him and said, uh, which business are you in? And he said, I make aircraft gears in the States. And I said, well, that's not our business. And sorry, you know, 40. He said, it doesn't matter which business you're in, try 100%. And we obviously in our mind said, this guy's mad, but thought about it and went back to our hotel rooms in the evening and said, you know, 100% doesn't look, why can't we try it? So we had desks with, with, with computers on top of our desks, which were taking about 30, 40% of space. And we had, uh, now, can I just stop? David, do tell me when I have talked too much and you just give me a sign of something. That's okay, I'll give you a sort of five minute warning. Yes, you know. okay, all right. So, uh, they were taking about 20 or 30, 30 or 40 percent of the space on our desk. And the person used to come from outside of from the street and sit in front of the desk. We had quite a lot of desks. And uh, what we thought was, why don't we take these computers and put them inside the desk, put a glass panel and reduce the desk by 30 or 40 percent in size. Thus, we can fit, fit more desks and thus we will obviously make more sales because there were enough people coming in. And then, what, and so we did, I'm just giving you business engineering here. And so we thought about, we never, we would never have thought about this if we had not gone for a hundred percent. We did all kinds of things. And uh, we, I mean, I, I normally in a, in a live audience, I, I, I do say, listen, how, how much do you think we went up with? And people make guesses, but when you do a stretch budget of 40%, and now this stretch budget of 100%, you don't get to 100% or get to 40%. But if you, go to, if you go do 40, you get to 20, whatever it is. Now, the thing here was that we actually went up by 40% in, 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 on the previous year. So stretch budgets to re-engineer a business is always a very good thing. It just makes you think. In 96, um, I was a, doing a course at Harvard Business School, and there was this professor, William Salman, terrific speaker, and uh, we were listening to him with, with you know, all attention. And he said, "Oh, uh, by the way, there's this new thing called the internet, and uh, the market capitalization of Yahoo, AOL, and, and Amazon." is equal to the GDP of Zambia, Kuwait, and New Zealand. And our mouths just dropped. And we said, well, why, how? Uh, how can a, a small company be as big as a country? Uh, because it's on the internet, you see. So uh, I went back, uh, came back to London and, and, and I said, you know, we've got to get into the internet somehow or the other. And, uh, uh, it was funny, I found a, a software developer in Germany who had made a, a software to connect to the airline reservation system. It was Sabre in those days. And uh, he said, Dinesh, even when you're sleeping, someone can make a booking and you can earn money. And I said, you know, Rudy, just, you know, forget it. And he said, listen, if you give me 100,000 Deutschmarks, I will put this system in you. And I said, no way, Jose. It's all a prank, and I'm not giving you 100,000. In the end, after about three weeks of negotiation, and I'm talking cash flow again, I agreed eight Deutschmarks per booking when a booking came, and I got paid. And he said, great, all right. I said, oh, there must be another catch. Why is he agreeing so fast? So he said, 
I said, you have to install it yourself. I'm not going to do anything. And uh, he said, fine, Dinesh, I'll do this. Anyway, he said, I also put on your mobile phone an SMS message that comes out at eight in the morning and at 12 midnight. So 12 midnight, you'll know how many bookings you've done in the day. And overnight, from 12 midnight to eight in the morning, you'll know how many bookings have come at night. And I said, great. For the first three weeks, the SMS messages were zero, 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 zero. <laughs> I said, thank God I didn't pay this guy any money because I would have regretted it and everyone called me such a fool. And anyway, one day, eight in the morning, two bookings. I said, uh-uh, this guy has made spoof bookings himself just to show me that it works. Anyway, it turned out that we'd been paid the money by credit card and we'd made money and uh, it all worked. I said, that's amazing. And then there was zero and then there were four and then there were two. And then, you know, it went up to a thousand in a month. In 2004, we did 1.6 million passengers in a year with a sales turnover of $1 billion. So that just in, in five years, so there is also the business of growth and how you can grow so fast and still try and keep control or not keep control. And that's another topic that I can talk about. Um, I want to talk, there are many other points, but I want to talk about monopolies and monopolies are good. Obviously, you don't, no one in the government likes monopolies, but when you're in business, you. you you love them because you have a captive market. Anyway, we went and raised $61 million on the NASDAQ. And uh, in those days, it was about 38 million pounds. And, uh, and I came back to London and, and uh, I went up to Google. Sorry, Google wasn't there. The, the Googles of the time were AOL and Yahoo. And I went to both the C CEOs of AOL and Yahoo and I said, would you like to, I'd like to do a three year deal with you where you can say Google, oh, sorry, AOL travel and Yahoo travel, but my engine will be behind and we'll be fulfilling and we'll be your travel partners. And they said, uh, okay, you raised 38 million pounds. We would like 19 million. And I said, what? You know, I mean, 90, you know, and I was just absolutely flabbergasted, walked out of the rooms with my tail between my legs. And I thought about it overnight with my wife. And I said, you know, these guys want 19 million pounds. But as the internet is going really, growing really fast and valuations are good, yeah, why don't we do it? So we went and signed two checks. 19 million pounds. And then we realized that an internet year is a dog year, which is seven years. So we had a monopoly with AOL and Yahoo for nearly 21 years as compared to our competition. And in three years, we went up from zero to $600 million in sales just on the back, okay, it was a deal for Germany, France, and the UK with all the associate countries. So it was a full deal. So we had Europe rather than just the UK. So just trying to tell you, there was a, it was a monopoly. No one knew it at the time. We had an idea for different reasons, but it turned out, now I'll talk to you about valuations. In 2000, the year 2000, our sales were $100 million, but our valuation was $700 million. I'm sticking to dollars because uh, we were on the NASDAQ, so I know the figures. And in 2004, our sales were $1 billion, but our valuation was $500 million. So think about it, 100 million sales, 700 million valuation, 500 million, uh, sorry, billion sales, the valuation comes down from 700 to 500. 
So why? And the reason is they don't look at the valuation like it's a house. They look at forward valuation. What can they make of this business in the future? Which of course I didn't know. And of course, when we had 9-11 in 2001, our sales were 200 million and our valuation was only 60 million. So it had come down from 700 to 60 to went, went up to 500. So you should, you should know how the city thinks, how money men think. And always sell when you think you're going to be, when everyone thinks that your business is going to go through the roof. So exit strategy, you only make money when the money hits your bank account. Otherwise it's all share paper. Otherwise it's all ego. Oh, I'm worth 500 million or I'm worth a billion. Sorry, you're worth nothing. Uh, because anything like a black swan event like COVID can happen and you could be finished. Um, and why did we sell? We sold because the internet was being de democratized. Everyone was getting it. And thus the monopoly situations was, you know, were, were, all those doors were closing. We had some big competitors like Expedia and, and Travelocity who had, we were spending 18 million pounds a year on, on marketing. They were spending 90 million pounds each on marketing. So before long, I mean, we would have been taken to the cleaners. So I, I also talked to my wife and we said, how much money are we going to get ourselves? And at that time, it turned out we were going to get after tax in nine figures, just nine figures and in pounds. And so that's equivalent to 50 lottery wins. And we said, hang on, that's good enough. I don't need any more, you know? So conclusions. Cash flows king, Bob Dylan, stretch budgets, monopolies are good, and money is made when it hits a bank account. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dinesh. That was excellent. Oh, David, David, one more thing. Yeah. Uh, I, I got this from Bill Gates, um, uh, thoughts from Bill Gates. And, and can I just say a few words on that? Please go ahead. Number one, life is not fair get used to it. Number two, if you think your teacher is tough, wait till you get a boss. <laughs> Number three, flipping burgers is not beneath your dignity. Our grandparents had a different word for flipping burgers. It was called opportunity. If you mess up, it is not your parents' fault. And before you were born, your parents weren't as boring as they are now. <laughs> they got that way for paying your bills and listening to you talk about how cool you are. <laughs> and the last point, be nice to nerds. Chances are you will end up working for one. <laughs> That's smashing. Dinesh, that was great. Thank you so much. Now, we're going to open it up to questions. We've got a couple of questions already, but can I ask uh, those people who are on the call, do feel free to post questions as we go. Um, this is the way it often plays out. We get questions on the run and we pick up as many as we can. So if I just go to the first question uh, from Andrew McFall. Andrew says, many thanks for such an interesting talk. What is or are the worst mistake or mistakes an entrepreneur can make? Okay. Uh... Thanks, Andrew, for the question. Um, there are many mistakes. And of course, we're learning as we're going along. It's just that we're trying to hide them from, from, from everyone else. Uh, but we're, we, for example, when you have a, a bad event like 9-11 and, and trade is coming back, or you have COVID like now, you haven't had, um, any trade for six months or, or, or very little, you want, and, and everything comes back, you, you might overtrade. And by overtrading, I mean giving credit, etc. If your cash flow is good, not a problem. 
but do not overtrade because a lot of companies go bust by overtrading, even though they've resisted the COVID pressures and everything else. So there are, I could have talked to you about all the mistakes I made, but then what's the point, you know? Uh, I want you all to be entrepreneurs. But anyway, no, no, there are lots of mistakes uh, you make. You, uh, I, for example, uh, three merchant banks came to me after we'd floated and said, uh, you know, your valuation is 700 million and we, uh, why don't we take 5% of your equity and put it in a blind trust so that we can manage it for you. So if anything happens to the business, uh, you have that money. And 5% uh, was 35 million at that time. And I thought, well, it's now 700 million. It's going to go to 3 billion. Why would I want to give 5% now? And of course, 9 11 happened a few months later and it went, went down to 60 million. So I kicked myself all the time, always, you know. I should have taken those five or 15% away with three merchant banks uh, and, and so I can carry on. So. Okay, Dinesh, the next question comes from Mark Ursel. Um, and he says, hi Dinesh, can you talk a bit more about securing the partnerships that you managed to uh, bring about and how did you feel that a monopoly was there for the taking? I, I didn't, uh, well, I thought I'd go and ask, but I never thought that they would agree. And they, when they made the, the, uh, uh, the offer of 19 million, perhaps didn't think I'd take it because it was such a horrendously large figure. Uh, and, and thus uh, it is worth paying for monopolies. The other sort of quasi monopoly I got was I also, I had a market of 300 million people because I'd opened up, um, I'd done a land grab and opened up uh, in 11 countries in Europe. So I was in, in the Northern Europe side. I had gone to Spain as well. And uh, that was 300 million people. So any competition with 60 million in those days, the UK was 60 million. Uh, all my competitors were selling to 60 million. I was selling to 300 million. So whenever the results would come out every half year, every year, every quarter, my results would be far, far better because of the larger market. And so it was like a monopoly because these guys just thought, oh my God, it's the internet. But it wasn't just the internet. It was also the footfall, as we call it, you know, because we were marketing to 300 million people. So those are all sort of quasi monopolies. So um, we have a sort of follow-up question here on um, the, the issue of monopolies, but um, maybe I could, uh, use this one as a, as a next question and perhaps circle back. This is from Emily Trifo or Trifold. Thank you for the talk. I have a few questions. First is, <laughs> how is Amazon having such a monopoly as it does in the market a good thing? It's not a good thing. I'm talking about as, a, as an entrepreneur. Ah. If you're an entrepreneur, uh, Emily, you would want a monopoly like Jeff Bezos wants. And, and by the way, the way he's done monopolies is he's, he's just become so large so fast. And that's with the backing of the US government and the backing of all the other um, um, private equity players behind Amazon. Because with, without the US government, they would have been taxed properly. And uh, even though I use Amazon, I think that they're, it's, it's too much. I mean, it's not a good, good thing. And, and their prices are sometimes much higher than than various other uh, shops, et cetera. So I don't agree with, uh, I agree with you. But I think that point you just made there, uh, Dinesh, about you know, a monopoly is particularly relevant for an entrepreneur it, it is an interesting um, slant on the whole idea of monopolies. It, it is interesting, you, you sometimes think, don't you, that somebody who creates monopoly from nothing, why don't they have the right to hang on to it? But companies do get to a size where it becomes simply impossible for them to be allowed to have the markets all to themselves. Correct, correct. And that's why the fangs need to be, without these, this is Facebook, uh, Google, et cetera, need to be um, uh, split, I think. The next question is from Giorgio Boito. Uh, and his question is, how could you support your business when you were not making a profit when it started off? The, 
the markets were, were supporting us because they, you see, we were three years behind the US, uh, Georgia. We were, uh, so that the bankers already knew what was going on to internet businesses. They were, they were growing so fast that they were becoming consolidations of businesses. So for example, if you had a million dollar business here, you would have, I would have done, a, if I did a billion dollars, I would have done a thousand of those businesses and consolidated them. And what that gives you is a lot of buying power, buying power with hotels, buying power with airlines, buying power with the CRS systems, the, the computer reservation systems. So that increases profitability. The next question is, Dinesh, are entrepreneurs born or can they be made? In other words, can entrepreneurship be acquired? I'm not sure about this, but the only thing I can say is necessity is the mother of invention. And uh, we you've got to be resourceful. And if you're resourceful, and that I could say about anyone who plays sport, any team games, you know, you know how to win. Res you will find the resources within your team to beat the other team. And that, that's what it's all about. Uh, I think lateral thinking is always a good thing. So thus traveling to different countries, reading about different countries would give you different thinking. But all in all, I'd say that anyone can be an entrepreneur. Okay. Um, another question here from Emily. Um, quite an interesting question, I think, from a, coming from a different perspective. Would you enlist the help of a coach if you were starting out? And indeed, Dinesh, what is your view of people taking on coaching inputs when they are already quite well established as entrepreneurs? I would, I would always, always recommend a coach or a mentor. I, I, I think a coach would be more hands-on, but a mentor would be much better. Mm. Where you're going to have problems all the time because the buck stops with you. There is no boss higher than you, apart from your bank manager. So. What you've got to do is you've got to, you know, be able to go to someone and talk. And it, it's like a psychiatrist, I guess. You, you just have to talk and, and you find your own solutions when you talk. And of course, they have to prompt you sometimes and they help you as well. So uh, it's always good to have that. Okay, the next question is from Freddie Foley. Um, would you invest today in the travel market in light of COVID-19 and the kind of world we're living in? <laughs> you know, it's so funny, uh, Freddie. I, I just got an offer from someone uh, who said that they would like to invest five million pounds in the travel, in travel businesses in the UK. And I replied back just now, about two hours ago. And I replied back, I've been out of the travel business for 15 years and George, I will not be able to, I might point you in the wrong direction and that's not going to be good for my credibility. So uh, yes, there are people who are always, obviously they're gonna be paying pennies to the pound for your business, but sure, there are always people available as long as it's worth, worth it. Um, Dinesh, here's a question from a fellow pupil. You will remember, I'm sure, Fayez Karim, who was in Galpins at the time that we were yeah. at Queen's. Um, and his uh, question is, by the way, hi, Fires. great to hear from you. Fires, we'd like to know what you're doing too. Anyway, <laughs> first of all. <laughs> uh, his question is, I want to know if Dinesh considered the franchise model at all. I didn't, because I didn't know much about the franchise model, Fires. Uh, I mean, I think franchising might've been good. Yes, there were Dayville Ice Cream and Baskin Robbins, but, but they, these were franchises. We never thought that the travel side, Perhaps it could have been, but God, we had to pay a mortgage. We, we had two small children and I mean, it was all touch and go. And some days when someone didn't pay us because they said they'd pay and they didn't pay us, we would be almost going broke. And so it wasn't easy. So, you know, I, I never thought of franchising. No, I'm sorry. We have a, another question here from Emily, um, and she asks, as a member of Innovate, how prepared slash far down the line do entrepreneurs have to be for you to lend them money? 
And what is your best advice to budding entrepreneurs who are applying for capital? I would, all of you, I would go to the Innovate UK website. I would, I would look, there are about 20 opportunities where you can get money. And uh, because of COVID, there's always a silver lining, as we were saying earlier. Um, we used to take six months to do our due diligence to pay, uh, uh, dish out money. We now do it in six weeks. So I would always go and do your own research and see what happens. And that goes for the school too, by the way, David. Yep, indeed. Um, the next question is, I know that you could spend two hours on this one, um, Dinesh, but it is a very good question. And if you can try to do a quick potted answer, that would be wonderful. What is the best way to avoid tax legally as a company? Don't make a profit. <laughs> <laughs> no tax. <laughs> but, but no, I mean, you know, there, there are many ways. And I think your accountants, uh, there are fantastic brains who, who will be able to tell you uh, the best ways. Obviously, you have to pay. But they'll, I'll tell you what, they'll save you more money than you have to pay them. Yeah. That's for sure. That's the truth. Next, we have a question from Nicholas Nugy, um, and he asks, do you recommend doing an MBA or equivalent qualification to someone who wants to become an entrepreneur? And thanks for the talk. Uh, Nicholas, thank you too. Uh, I, I think that it's sometimes a lot of knowledge is not good because if, you, if I had worked out that it's gonna to be touch and go for a couple of years or three years, I wouldn't have taken the dive uh, and you know doing a, an MBA you would work out all the cash flows and you'd work out all the uh, situations etc and I can tell you this that uh, it's better to use common sense obviously I, I'm pushing for schools to have uh, entrepreneur education I'm pushing for that especially uh, the last three or four years um, because I feel that that you know financial literacy is a very good thing and it's not literacy in a big way it's just you know just understanding you also learn creativity you also learn persistence it is so important for for for, for doing this in school and perhaps at university but not i've done an mba by the way but afterwards mm -hmm. so i didn't do an mba um uh, and then do this i went into business and i think uh um, it, it helped not doing one. But that's me, personally. Um, the next question from Guy Barker is a little bit of a slant on a previous question, but it's still a very interesting point, I think. He asks, is there an entrepreneurial gene? Well, I, I, I make a lot of money by just put planting my genes everywhere. No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. The only thing I know is that, that one can, can do that gene therapy with CRISPR. Now there's, there's a new technology. Um, a lady won the Nobel Prize in 2020 for it. So these are things that you can do, but I'm not sure if you can do not find what, what, what an entrepreneurial gene looks like. Uh, the next question is, to some extent, I think was covered somewhat in your talk, but there may be other insights you can bring out here, Dinesh. And it is, are there any rules that you would swear by as an entrepreneur that prevent or help to prevent bankruptcy? Always be honest. Always tell your bankers way in advance, uh, don't hide. Um, and I think that um, show them how you can get out of this problem um, rather than show them I'm dying, save me. So our problem, uh, we had a, good thing going in that we were usually good on cash flow because we paid the airlines for the month, let's say we were talking February, for the first of the 28th of February, we would pay on the 17th of March. So we had always got a four week um, float, so to speak. But when 9-11 happened, we had to pay out 40 million pounds worth of refunds because people just wanted to cancel. And we were running really short uh, and, and we didn't know how we were going to meet the, um, the, uh, uh, the wages, et cetera. 
you know, we're talking about a large organization at that time, but we did tell the banks and uh, I'm sure, well, there was no such thing like uh, this, like the COVID thing, that there was always a, there was a big safety net, but uh, I'm sure we, we would uh, have made it, but you always must be honest. Yeah. The next question is a bit of a crystal ball question, um, but uh, great fun, I think. What, in your view, is the next big opportunity to ride after the previous internet growth? Uh, perhaps another way of putting that question, Dinesh, is if you were starting out now as a budding entrepreneur, where would you see the big opportunity uh, wave beginning to crest? Well, I think it's going to be in technology. And it's, as you say, internet, there'll be something else. I was told the other day that 6G, we've talked about, we know about 5G, which is very fast compared to today, but 6G will download Netflix movies, 142 hours of Netflix movies in one second. But going on to the, the technology itself, I was talking about 3D technology in manufacturing. And we, I, I was listening to a professor called Hod Lipson at Columbia University. And he, he said, because you can make complex designs and you, you, you basically don't need, uh, you know, those, what do they call the, uh, the manufacturing uh, line, uh, assembly lines, because a, a, a 3D printer can manufacture the whole thing in one go. So bicycle chains, you don't need the screws, you don't need any of that. Manufacturing costs are going to go down to zero. And in fact, if you have a slab versus a few holes in the slab, the holes in the slab which make a design is going to cost you less because there's less material. So what's really going to be at a premium is design rather than uh, manufacturing components or things. Now, if you see these technologies coming through, you should be able to build businesses on the basis of these technologies. And I have to think through this, but I know that there are quite a lot of businesses being invested in now in the States. There's a SPAC maniac and that SPAC, SPAC is, a, is a, where people just take a good entrepreneur, let's say, yeah, anyone, uh, someone who's just sold a business to, uh, for a bit of money, and say, okay, we'll give you $300 million. You invest, buy a business and run it, we will back you. That's a SPAC. And uh, the, the US is just going crazy about SPACs at the moment. So there are things happening there. A lot of money is being thrown. So I don't know. Okay. I don't know. A question from Eleanor McCaffrey. Um, she says, thank you for an insightful talk, Dinesh. But she asks a most interesting and quite profound question, I think. How do you feel your wealth has changed you? Well, I, I didn't know what to do when I received that check uh, on the 1st of March, many, many years ago. And, um, well, anyway, the long, short answer of that is that I went, for, went in, into the charity world for 10 years. And I sat on various trust. I was a trustee of various boards and I started charities. And uh, we, um, we, for example, I thought I'd do a couple of charities in India. I did those. We give 120,000 people free medicine uh, every year through 15 clinics. We uh, have educate 1,100 street children in school, give them uniforms, give them a good meal at lunch because we know they don't get good proper food at home. And uh, so, I, and, and I've done a lot of charitable work here in the UK. Um, I'm on the committee for, for Memorial Gates. I'm on the, um, uh, I'm a trustee. I'm a trustee of LEPRA, the World Leprosy uh, uh, Foundation. Uh, and uh, I was on the Winston Churchill Memorial Trust Board. I was a trustee. I was also on uh, uh, scope, cerebral palsy. So I did a lot of that for 10 years. And after 10 years, I had a 10 year non-compete by the way, uh, in travel. 
after 10 years, I decided not to go back into the travel business and joined politics. And I became a member of the European Parliament for a few months um, before we Brexited. So that was good fun too, actually. Okay, um, we've got a few more questions. I'm not sure we'll be able to cover them all, Dinesh, as we're yeah. running a little bit short of time, but I'll try to cover as many okay. as I can. First of all, before I forget, I've just had another uh, comment from uh, Fires, and he's pinged me to say, let's talk. So um, we'll forward you his email, which he sent us. Um, and he said under that, I'm a franchise expert and spent 35 years with Subway Sandwiches as my chosen brand. Would love to connect and chat. So I'm sure you and Fires would- I will, I will take his, his, you ask me the question, I'll take his, his um, email address down. Okay, his email address is Fires K. No, I've got that, I can read it. Okay, you can see it, that's great. Okay, let's go back to the other questions then. Um, one here from Giorgio Boite again, saying, thank you for answering, sir. At the beginning of the talk, you said, there is a scenario you hope will not happen. What is it? <laughs> um, what was I saying? I was saying, oh, uh, scenario. Was it in relation to where we were with the recovery or the time oh, yeah. to the recovery of the pandemic? Well, uh, I don't, I don't remember exactly what I was thinking at that time, but I, I just hope that, that we don't have 15 to 20 percent unemployment. And, right. and, uh, and this unemployment needs to be staggered. And I think the government's doing a good job, even though I'm not part of the Tory party, it's doing a good job in doing this. And I feel that we need to not have civil disobedience. And uh, because, I, I mean, I know that car thefts have gone up three times in London already. Uh, and, and, you know, things un, need to be sorted pronto. Okay. There's an interesting question here, Dinesh, uh, taking us to a different area of uh, business. Um, and it is, what is the key to growing small businesses in an industry that is already well established? Say, clothing, for example. I think there's always uh, an angle in which you can grow businesses because you can get hold of buyers that other people can't. You might have contacts or a better Rolodex that others can't. There might be some people who are wanting to retire, who don't want to do the work and so on and so forth. So there are, you don't know these opportunities, but if you work hard, I mean, I remember um, Mark, who asked a question earlier, and, and I know his marketing business, Mark Ursel. I mean, he, it, it was touch and go in the beginning for him, and now he's doing really well. So, you know, you need to be persistent and, and, and you need to um, try and invent and reinvent and try and see how you can do better. Uh, it works most of the time. If you, if you work hard. An interesting question from Andrew McFall, uh, who asks, are successful business people who give a significant helping hand to their children actually hindering their hunger for success? Totally, totally. <laughs> my, 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 my children, um, my, I have two sons uh, who are now 42 and 40, and they, uh, uh, um, it's too much, well, they basically say it. it's too much like hard work, dad, you know? And of course we let them go and not done anything. Of course, it's very difficult to do that. Uh, then um, we would have, uh, perhaps they would have made a life of themselves. But I, I mean, in, in entrepreneurship, they've made a good life by the way, uh, as it is, but uh, they would have made perhaps uh, become entrepreneurs. And we have a question here, and hopefully you will be able to put your finger on something, maybe not. What is your favorite book that also proved useful in um, looking at and considering entrepreneurship? Oh, no. Do you know, I'm sorry, um, Anonymous, but <laughs> frankly, I, 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 we just didn't have the time to read. <laughs> between, between you, you won't believe it, but... We never, we weren't thinking where is our next penny coming from. We were thinking of how much work we've got to do and go and do that. And oh no, God, we have to do that. And how about that? You've got to deliver these tickets and you've got to do this. And, you know, it was, 
like you just totally forgot about the money. And, uh, and uh, fortunately it happened, it came back. And I think I'll close on this uh, question, it's quite a, a detailed question, but obviously very relevant and one where you I'm sure will have some insights. And it is, you raised the fall in travel valuations after 9-11. How far down the line do you think that travel will recuperate after COVID-19? And do you think there's potential for travel industry to prosper beyond the rates prior to COVID-19 as a result of a boom that may follow? There will certainly be a boom. There'll certainly be a boom. There's no question about it. Uh, because I can feel it in my bones. I want to travel. Everyone is the same. We've been cooped up for too long. It, it depends on, on who gets the business. And that's very, very important. So uh, I think this, if you, if you can do well in sales in the next few months or a year or year and a half, it's a good time to sell and perhaps come back if you like later on. So I haven't answered the first part of the question, which I forgot. Tell me again, David. Um, just bear with me, just bringing it up. You raised the fall in travel valuations after 9-11. How far down the line do you think the travel will recuperate yes. after COVID-19? I, I think that you, you can't be, uh, you can't bring timing with you. Sometimes after, when I sold in 2005, uh, a few people said, what a dumbass, you know, selling such a great business. And in 2008, when everything went down the tube, uh, he said, well, a lot of people came up and said, what a great thing you did, <laughs> you know, selling in 2005. And by the way, when I went into the internet, uh, all my friends, I used to play golf with them in, uh, in the travel business uh, used to say, you are so dumb, Dinesh, going on the internet. What is the internet? It's rubbish. You know, I mean, just, it's an American phenomenon. Forget it, you know? And some of them had to kiss my ring afterwards. <laughs> I love it. Dinesh, I have a, a, a final question for you. It, 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 it's a bit of a sort of holy grail question, but people talk a great deal in business and in the sort of whole area of, commercial life about risk and how you assess risk and how you live with risk. Do you think that having a real sharp appetite for risk is an essential component in being an entrepreneur? I think you need to, to have an appetite for risk, but not just for the sake of, let me buy um, a, a lottery ticket because that's risk. But I mean, look at the, the odds. Uh, the odds are just not worth you know, it's not worth spending the money for the odds. So I, I think that, uh, you know, when you cross a road, you look right, left and right. And then you cross a, the road. You're reducing the risk rather than just walking on the road from 100% to 1%. And so you've got to do that. Reduce the risk as much as possible, but still cross the road. And that should be done in everything you do in business or in life, you'll do better. Of course, we don't do it, of course. It's not that. <laughs> well, Dinesh, thank you so much. And thank you particularly for answering all the questions so succinctly. Sadly, sometimes we're not able to get through most of the questions because the answers take too long. So I think you scored very well on that front. <laughs> and now <laughs> I'd like you. to hand you back to Greg Hunter. Thank you, David. Well, thank you, David. Thank you, Dinesh. Can I, can I jump in with an answer about the book one? And, and uh, I'll let you in a secret. A couple of days ago, Dinesh and I met up. I, we had a great discussion. And I referred to one of a really enjoyable book I read, which was a, a book called Shoe Dog by Phil Knight. And if and uh, it was not expensive at all. I think I picked up for five pounds at some bookstore. And honestly, it was a great read. And for those that don't know, Phil Knight uh, was a person who started Nike. And, and he summed up exactly what Dinesh said about running a running a business and leading a new on being an entrepreneur. And you put all your effort into the business, but also actually the sleepless nights and uh, that 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 Phil had, and I'm sure Dinesh would have had, where you're not quite sure whether it's going in the right direction, and you got to, you're taking that leap of faith. So uh, thank you so much, Dinesh, for such a, a, a wonderful talk. Your brutal honesty. Um, 
uh, an advice to everybody. Uh, everybody, everybody took something from that part. David, thank you for your time uh, and and leading the question and answer part with a plum and uh, and it was it, it was really really enjoyable and, and we, we got much from it. Can, Dinesh, can I just ask you a quick question? Sorry, I've just you know between you and I, you know nobody else is listening, right? No, no, no. You know, no nobody else is listening. I, I I just moved some money from my uh, cash ISA to my stocks and shares ISA. Seriously. And I'm about to invest. I'm really keen. I haven't. I haven't looked at the the, the tech shares before. You know, it, should I invest now? I think maybe Auto Trader or even Rightmove.com. Should you invest now? Should I put my money? I'm not somebody who's going to buy and sell straight away. I'm in for the long haul. Well, if you if you if you put this money on the twenty, the end of March last year, when COVID was going into full swing, on the Nasdaq or the tech, that went up by fifty five percent the NASDAQ in the, by the end of the year. It's up this year by three or 4% already. So technology is not a bad thing. Just the index. You don't need a, need a share just by the index. So you think just buy a tracker? Uh, exactly. But I haven't said that, it might go down. So, so please don't. <laughs> no, don't, don't, don't worry, I'll, I'll, don't worry, don't worry. I'll, I'll come to you when it goes wrong. <laughs> Look, thank, thank you so much for your talk again. Thank, thank, you, thank you, Dinesh. Thank you, David. And, uh, you know, I, um, it, it, was, it, was, it was really enjoyable. And, uh, and we look forward to hopefully having you back again for another talk soon. And we'll welcome you back to, to King's uh, uh, when, uh, when we can, when COVID times aren't there. Thank you so much. Thanks, David. Thank you. Thank okay. You. So thank you very much. Look, and finally, thank you so much for joining us tonight. It was a wonderful talk. Good night.